And thanks for that, Brother Caleb. Um, so uh, it's a great chapter there in Exodus 34. We'll come back to that at the end of the sermon. Um, but today I'm preaching a sermon on the goodness of the Lord. Um, and now there's no lack of content in the Bible. The Bible's just full of the goodness of the Lord. It's such a great th theme through the entire scriptures. But I'm just going to cover some, uh, some today, and perhaps another time I'll get to some others. Um, but I'll get you first to turn to Psalm 27. So in Psalm 27, verse 10, it says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So David preached about the protection of the Lord. Uh, God's judgment on, on his enemies as well as God's enemies. Um, and these are the people who will persecute and you know, give you persecution, tribulation for the saints. You know, Obviously the Old Testament had the same problem that the New Testament has where people who hate God are going to persecute the people of God. Um, so David's writing here about the, the, the Lord fights for us and he is the strength and protection for his people. And we see many stories, especially as Brother Jason preached this morning about King Asa, um, you know, where he was there with the battles that, they went, that Israel went into these battles. David's enemies were defeated by the Lord. The apostles were spared by angels who came and either let them down by a basket or let them out of prison, you know, destroyed the walls of the prison and allowed them to just walk out. Uh, we also saw the prophets, like uh, through miracles, Elisha, where he smote the enemy uh, with blindness and then th sent them away to be inside their enemies' camps rather than coming after them. You know, so God's protection, we see it all throughout the Old Testament. We also see it in the New Testament. Um, that we can go to God for protection because he is a good God. He, his goodness towards us is that he would protect us, his people, from the enemies of God and from our enemies. So uh, I'll get you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. But I'll just read to you from 2 Samuel 22, 31. It says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. So the Lord's our shield. And it says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Um, Psalm 61, 3 says, For thou had been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. It's a tower that we can actually run to. We can run to the Lord and he's going to protect us. That's the goodness of the Lord, um, is that he hasn't left us alone on this earth, but we actually have someone we can go to, someone we can cry out to. And Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a, is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. So if you ever want safety, safety is of the Lord. You know, you, the goodness of the Lord is that he provides us somewhere we can go and be safe, somewhere we can go and he'll protect us from our enemies and from the enemies of God. And I've mentioned in the last sermon that I preached a couple of weeks ago how all the promises of God are yea. So every promise we see here of God, we know it's yea, that it is positive, it is going to happen, it's as good as it is written, because in him is yea. And, uh, you know, our hope rests in those promises and in his goodness. So today we're looking at the goodness of the Lord and his promises. Um, and the first thing here is that God is our salvation and strength. We can trust in his goodness and his love and mercy toward us. And we can hope in his word and the salvation of our flesh in this world against our enemies. He's our strong tower. So even in this world, we have our enemies. And God has his enemies. And we can be protected if we go to the Lord through prayer and just say, Lord, look, you know, like David did many times, I need help. You know, my enemies surround me. They compass me round about and they want to destroy me. I need your help and your safety. And we can trust in that safety. And that's what he wants us to understand. And the goodness of God is that he didn't leave us on this earth alone. We have that hope, the hope of the spirit and the comforter that he left with us. Um, you know, many in this world, they believe that God's a hands-off God, that he just created the earth and the people and just walked away and is just watching what happens. But he's a very active God. We know that. As people of God, we understand how active he is in our lives, in the lives of his people. He didn't forget about us. You know, he's still here for us. 
In fact, even in church, you know, Christ is here with us. Where two or more are gathered in his name, there is he amongst us. So, you know, if you're saved, you understand that that's false because you have the Spirit of God in you. So God himself is with you always. And he says he'll never leave nor forsake you. And that's, that's always testifying. That Spirit is always going to testify to you that God is never going to leave you nor forsake you. So you're there in 2 Corinthians 1. Look at verse 3. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of your same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers for the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Now, the consolation and comfort, they basically mean the same things. You know, when you console someone, you're comforting them. And so it's talking about the comfort of God, where when we go through tribulation for the cause of Christ, when we're persecuted for the name of Christ, then God comforts us. And also we're there to comfort the brethren. We'll get to that shortly. So, and Paul continues in verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raised the dead. So as Brother Jason preached this morning, it's, you know, we don't, you don't trust in his car, we don't trust in our things, you don't trust in your chariot, you trust in the Lord. And so that's where you go when you need consolation. That's where you go when you need comfort. And when you need protection, you need strength and safety. We go to the Lord. He's the one who raised from the dead. In verse 10, it says, Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. So again, God's the comfort. He's the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies. Um, so again, when we're being persecuted, which Christ himself went through, and we're all going to go through, you know, because the servant is not above his master. If Jesus was persecuted, then so will we. And for the same reason, it should be for the same reason, that we're walking in Christ Jesus in righteousness. But Jesus is there with us. You know, he, he partakes in our suffering and comforts us when we're going through that. And that's an amazing thing to have. You know, we also have reward for our suffering um, and the persecution and tribulation because our God is a living God. He hasn't forgotten about us. But outside in the world, they don't have anything. They have a false God. Everybody has a false God. But their God is dead. And so when the unsaved and the false Christians are persecuted, there's no reward for them. There's no hope for them. But we have hope in God. Our hope is in his comfort. Our hope is in his reward, in the salvation and the resurrection of our bodies. You know, Jesus was persecuted, so he understands what we're going to go through. So that's how he's able to comfort us accordingly. So we have a God which came down from heaven, lived as a man. He was persecuted as a man, suffered those things, and now he can comfort us when we go through those things. There's no God that can do that but our God. I'll get you to turn to Romans chapter 15 in verse 1. But we need to seek his comfort. That's why we have to go through prayer to seek the comfort of God. But if we seek him, then he will comfort us. So in Romans 15 verse 1, it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 
Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the reasons God left us here, obviously, is to be a light unto the world through the gospel of Christ. But another reason we're here is to be comfort to the brethren, because we're all in the same boat. We're all saved by grace through faith, and we're all still sinners. We're all going to you know, have times where we need to be comforted by our brethren. You know? So if you're, having, if you're in, in good spirits and your brother's not, then our job is to lift our brother's spirits, is to be a comfort unto them. When they're going through tribulation, we suffer with them, and we, we bring them back to good, you know, back to cheerfulness. And we're also to bear one another's burdens. So if you look at verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So the Scriptures give us great comfort. The Word of God gives us great comfort. If you want to comfort your brethren, then the Scriptures is where you should go. And you find comfort yourself. The things that comfort you help to comfort your brethren. There's a Scripture for everything. So if your brother's going through something in his life, then find a Scripture to help and to bring comfort to them. Um, I'll get you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. But it's important for us to comfort others. But you can't comfort others if you're not getting comforted by God, which is why we need to walk in righteousness and you know, keep a good account with God and to be comforted of Him. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourself know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. So they sent Timothy to comfort the church at Thessalonica. And I'm sure many of them shared stories of persecution and tribulation they'd all been through. And they comforted them themselves through the stories, through God actually sparing them and saving them from their circumstances and uh, also from the scriptures. So it's a great comfort reading the stories of these great saints for us, uh, where we see where they were persecuted and delivered. You know, reading the stories of the great saints who were, who were persecuted, but they suffered patiently and were rewarded greatly for it. Continue in verse 7, 1 Thessalonians 3. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. So again, we see the brethren who sent Timothy, they were comforted by the good report that they received, you know, when, when he went to Thessalonica. And the church was standing in good faith among the tribulation and affliction. They were standing together, they were united, and they were comforting one another. And it says they were comforted by the faith of others. And that's something we can get comfort from as well. When our brethren show great faith, then we can also be comforted by the faith and the report that we get back from them. And that's also why it's so important to be at church. You can't be comforted by the brethren when you're so far away. Like here, here they got a report back from Timothy and they were comforted by that, by the faith that Timothy reported. But had Timothy not gone, there's no report. If those people weren't gathering together, that's how they comfort one another. That's how we comfort each other here, is by showing up to church and being comforted of the brethren. 
You know, so the hearing and sharing of the word of God is also very comforting. And that shows us how we can be a comfort to it to the brethren is through preaching the word of God, through finding a scripture that helps them in their time of need. And even if you just use Proverbs, there's a proverb for everything. You know, there's, there's literally a scripture for every circumstance you might be in that'll give you some comfort because you love the word of God. Um, just turn over the page to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, we exhort, how we exhorted comfort and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of truth which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath of God is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. So again, Paul always had a, had a heart for the people in all the churches that he wrote his epistles to, that he was sad that he couldn't be there with all of them, that he couldn't comfort them in person. But he was always sending letters of comfort to them and receiving reports back. But we should be a comfort to the world, obviously, through the gospel is how we can be a, comf a comfort to the world. We can bring them the goodness of the Lord through salvation. But it's also to love and care for the brethren and to comfort those who are going through any kind of persecution or tribulation or affliction. And Paul's speaking of the, the affliction that the church was suffering at the hands of, of Judaism. They're the ones who killed our Lord and Saviour. And that comfort came through the word of God being preached. It came through the salvation that Christ has given to us and the fellowship of the brethren when they were meeting together at church. Both of those who were present and those who were away through those letters of report and the epistles that Paul wrote. But our heart should be towards comforting the brethren. And we need to partake of their sufferings as well. Just having compassion and empathy and being able to comfort them with scriptures. I'll read to you from... Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. It says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner for, is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So this is our salvation of the soul. And this is where our anchor is. This is why we can be steadfast and sure, because God comforts, comforts us through the hope of our salvation, the hope that he will return for us someday and will we'll give us our new heavenly bodies. We'll get to that a little bit later. But we know, we know that God cannot lie. That's how we can trust in the consolation of God. That's how we can trust in the comfort. That's how we can trust in his promises. It's, it's impossible for God to lie. And yeah, the, prom the goodness of God is that his promises are yea. And he opens the door that no man can close and closes the door that no man can open. So when you're saved... No one's coming to close that door. You've already walked through it. You're already a son of God. You've got the spirit of God, the earnest of the inheritance. You know, so once you believe on him, you're his forever. And nobody can take that away from you. That's how we can be so steadfast and sure in those promises of God. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, 
even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace he are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So I'll get you to turn to Hebrews chapter 7. But again, we saw in, uh, in that passage as well as in Exodus 34, it says the goodness of God is grace, mercy and salvation for the forgiveness of our sins. And that's for salvation of the soul as well as after salvation. God forgives our sins when we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Jesus lives forever to be our mediator. I've preached on that as well before. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So in Hebrews 7 verse 24, it says, But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto, him, unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For he did once when he offered up himself. Of course, that's talking about Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross when he offered up himself. But the goodness of God is not only is salvation easy, but we receive the imputed righteousness of Christ. Again, that was something that Brother Jason covered quite well this morning. We receive that imputed righteousness of Christ. So we're able to stand before God the Father. It says God puts our sins behind his back and he remembers them no more. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he separated us from our sin. So if you turn to Romans chapter 4, I'll read to you from Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 to 12. It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write in them their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities I will I remember no more. So again, the goodness of God means that what we do in this flesh will be rewarded for the good, but our sins will be forgotten. We won't pay for our sins because Jesus Christ paid for all our sins. That's the goodness of God. So we will be chastened here on the earth for our sins in this flesh, but our sins, when it comes to our eternal judgment, in our position before God, our sins are remembered no more. They're forgotten and they're forgiven. Um, but the only hope the unsaved have is they're going to be judged for all their sins because they don't have the imputed righteousness of Christ, they don't have the Spirit of God, they're not born of God, so they are going to pay for their sins. And that's the unfortunate thing. Again, that's why, why preaching the gospel is the way we can comfort the world because that's the only comfort and hope that they have. So you'll be in Romans chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So, you know, Abraham received it by faith, just like we receive it by faith. And it says that, uh, blessed is the man to whom the Lord would not impute sin. So your sin will not be imputed to you because it was imputed to Christ. Christ died for it. He died for the sins of everyone, especially those that believe. But, uh, yeah, we received the same. So, but how good is it that the God of all things, he chose to come down? It was a choice that Jesus made. You know, he said he did it willingly. It's not a choice that somebody made for him. He came down here to die for us. He paid for our sins. He paid our ransom. But not only that, but he imputes his perfect righteousness onto us as well. So we're not only left with no sin, but we're also left with the righteousness of Christ. It's his holiness and his righteousness, you know, for his entire life, from the time he was born to the time he was crucified and, and died and rose again, that all of his perfect life was imputed unto us, everything he did. And that's the goodness of God. <coughs> right. 
Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Uh, feel free to turn there. But it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us before him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved. So again, the Lord's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. We're made children, and it says we'll stand before him blameless. But that's only because of his imputed righteousness. That's why when God looks at us, he sees the imputed righteousness of Christ. He sees us as his perfect children who cannot sin because that's the part that's born of God, whereas we still have the flesh which is corrupted and cannot be brought into subjection to the things of God. But that's the way God looks at us, and that's how we can stand before him holy and without blame. You know, it says blameless. It's because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. And the goodness of the Lord as well, moving on to the next point, is that he hears our prayer. Because we just aren't like the heathen who's speaking to the air vainly. But our God actually hears us. He loves us and he answers our prayer. But we have to seek after him and we actually have to make our requests heard. Uh, Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. That means the Lord is near or present. Like the Lord is at hand. Whenever we pray, the Lord's right there next to us. He hears our prayer. And it says the Spirit, you know, sometimes changes our prayer uh, and intercedes for us so that we don't always know what to ask for, but the Spirit does and God does, and He hears our prayers. But we have to ask. Verse 6, Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God. And I think that's important too with, with prayer, but also with thanksgiving. While you're praying, you should always be thanking God. And we'll see why in a second. It says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So if we don't pray, and pray just means to ask. You need to ask God for something. There's one thing to, to be praising the Lord and to giving thanks for what he has done, for the answered prayers and the things he's given you in this life. But you also need to ask for things. And sometimes that's asking you know, for a battle, for God to win the battle for you, to, to show you the way. Sometimes it's you know, just something you may need. Or just whatever kind of comfort, whatever you need, just go to the Lord and ask. And look, you know, as long as it's not to fulfill your own lust of the flesh, God will answer your prayer. Yeah, and King, King David understood that very well because he was constantly in prayer. And we have many good examples in the Psalms of his prayers where he was praying for, for salvation, praying for comfort, praying for his enemies to be destroyed or to leave him alone, for him to be saved and spared from that. But we can learn from those as well, how to pray. You know, obviously we have the example that Christ gave of the Lord's Prayer. But again, you don't vainly repeat that. That's just an idea of how you should pray to God. But, you know, it's very important that we pray and we ask God because he will hear our prayers, but also to pray with thanksgiving. And Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of needs. God wants us to come to him in the throne room. Our Father is waiting for us to come before him, to petition him. And Christ has prepared the way for us. And we have a God who understands our infirmities. You know, Jesus understands what it's like to be tempted by sin and yet not sin. Jesus understands what it's like to be persecuted and afflicted, having committed no crime. Yet he bear it patiently. You know, we can come to him anytime. We can share our sorrows, our pains, everything we're feeling. We can share that with God because he understands and comforts us. And there's no God but our God that can do that. And that's the goodness of the Lord. And Jesus also said, I will not leave you comfortless. You know, the goodness of God sends good men and brethren to comfort and refresh us, like we saw with Paul and Timothy. 
And Paul was refreshed and comforted by the brethren. And he's always listing them at the end of his epistles, the people who comforted him, the people who labored with him, who gave him, you know, who were able to, to help him to keep going. Because Paul had it pretty tough. In the New Testament, I don't think, bar Jesus, nobody had it tougher than Paul. In uh, 2 Corinthians 1.21, it says, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So again, God's given us a heavenly home. And we already grown within ourselves to go home and to leave this place. Of course, it's needful that we're here, as I said, firstly to preach the gospel of comfort to the world, but also to comfort each other while we're here. So we see the comfort of God and the goodness of God relieves that earnest of, the in, of our inheritance, which is the comfort of the Holy Ghost, the one Jesus said would come. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are, we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labour that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So again, we know our, our works, they're going to be tried of what sort they are. And the good profitable works will stand, but the unprofitable works will be burnt up. But that's our hope. Our hope is, you know, firstly, that Christ is going to come and redeem our bodies one day. That's the, that's the heavenly that it's speaking about here, being clothed in the heavenly, in the house from heaven. But also that, you know, we're going to receive rewards for everything we do. But God doesn't see the bad that we do. And again, that's something we're not going to be judged on. The unsaved will be judged on, on, their, on their works, good or bad. But God will only see the good, the things we did in the spirit. They're the things that will abide and they're the things that we'll be rewarded with. In uh, 1 Corinthians 3.12, it says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, that foundation, of course, being on Christ, it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So that's an important thing as well. Eternal salvation is not a reward that's ever offered for works. Your works, good or bad, they cannot pay for your salvation in any way. You know, salvation is only available as that free gift in Jesus Christ. It's the only way it's available. But every work we do in this life they will be tried and burned. So if it survives, we'll receive a reward. If it doesn't survive, then we lose it. We lose reward, but we can never lose our eternal life because that's never on offer to begin with. But that's why we should also strive to do things in the spirit for those things that have spiritual value so that the works we do will abide and we'll receive great reward from God. I'll get you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. But that's the thing, we don't want to suffer loss or reward. You know, you'll, you'll be saved, but the more work you do on spiritual things, the more rewards you'll have. You know, that, that's also more crowns you'll have to lay at Jesus' feet. So, you know, if you, the more rewards you have to lay at Jesus' feet, the more worship and glory you can give him. So the better we do here, the better we can do there too. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, 
according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in all, in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even to him. So I'll get you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 next. But the goodness of God is our hope that as he's redeemed our souls and saved us through his perfect gift and his sacrifice, that he is going to come and redeem our bodies also. Like, no, again, no other religion has, no other God can promise that. But God is going to come back and rede- he's given us the earnest. The earnest is a down payment. That means he's coming back to pay the rest. The rest comes when, when the rapture happens. That's the resurrection. And we'll, we'll be gathered together with him on that glorious day of the Lord. So the goodness of the Lord is that we will be like him in that day. Well, what a promise is that? As he received the glorious body, we also will receive one like it. I'll read to you from 1 John 3, 2. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So again, we'll, when we see Christ appear in the clouds, that's when we're going to be changed. In the moment of a twinkling of an eye, we're going to receive our new bodies and be like, like him. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. It says, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So of course, Christ the first fruits, that's when he was raised from the dead, received his glorified body. So he's the first fruits. He's the first among many brethren. So he received it then. We're still waiting to receive ours. Go down to verse 42. It says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So our body today, our flesh, is just corrupt. But we're going to receive an incorruptible body to match the perfect spirit that we have that's born of God. Go down further to verse 47. It says, The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Speaking of the two Adams. Um, as is the earthy, such are also they that are earthy. As is the heavenly, so are they also that are heavenly. As we are born the image of the earthy, so we're, we're born in the image of Adam in the flesh, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So we shall bear that image of Christ when he returns, when we see him as he is. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption that's why we're not going to inherit the kingdom of god in this flesh this flesh has to die flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god but the perfect man the man born of god that we receive the minute we the second we get saved we believe on the lord we receive that new man is born again he's revived then that's the one who's going to stand before god he's going to stand before god holy and blameless which is why we won't pay for our sins and it's understanding this that, that gives you such comfort, just to understand that, you know, you're able to live your life on this earth, knowing that the flesh is corrupt, but it's going to die, but that you have a perfect spirit which stands before God, holy and blameless. And it's, that's the law of liberty. That's the beauty of walking in the spirit, knowing you're not going to commit sin if you walk in the spirit, because the spiritual man cannot sin. And that's why we're commanded so many times to walk in the spirit. Uh, Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Go down to verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, and that ties in with the goodness of the Lord for reward also. But our labor is not in vain if we're abounding in those good works, work, walking in the Spirit and doing spiritual works. And our bodies will be changed so that we'll be like Christ on that day. The perfect new man will be completed with perfect flesh. And that's where our hope is. Our hope is in that very thing. But how good is it for God to do this for us? That's the goodness of God. Like, God doesn't have to make us like his son. He doesn't have to give us a perfect body and a perfect spirit. He could have just created us and left us alone, but God loves us. And he created us so that we can worship him willingly. That's why he gave us free will. So that those who choose to become his sons 
are the ones who are going to worship him forever in eternity. And Christ, it says, was the first of many brethren in the new heavens and new earth. And that's why I just love the truth of it. That's the promise he's given to us and we can trust it. I get you to turn to Romans chapter 6. I'll read to you from Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So our vile body gets changed into a Christ's perfect body. And he's the first among many brethren. And that's going to be a beautiful thing. So in Romans 6, look at verse 4. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And that's, that's the promise. That, you know, that's why we do baptism. We're picturing the death, burial and resurrection, not just of Christ, but also of us. We're partaking of that. Our old man is dying. That's what we need to do every day to kill the old man and to walk in the spirit, in the new man. And that's, that's what we should do. But we'll also receive that vile body will be changed into a perfect body. That's the hope we have. We're not stuck in this state forever, which is why we can be comforted by those words. Another way the goodness of the Lord is shown unto us is how generous he is with us. So I'll get you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Now we should count our blessings and we give praise unto God. Um, but we should also record, it, it's good to record or at least make mental note of, of the things, the prayers God has answered, the things he's done for you, the great rewards you've already received, the blessings you've received. Because it also will help you to be more liberal with your giving when you understand how much God has done for you. And he commands us to give to the brethren and to, to comfort others, you know, and to be, to be very generous with what we have. Because God loves a cheerful giver, especially when it's to the brethren in, in need. So 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now how, how good a promise is even that? Imagine just having all sufficiency in all things. Could you imagine? Like that's, that's what God says, look, you give not out of necessity, not with a grudging heart, but you just give because you love your brethren, you give because you want to comfort them and, um, and all of that. It says the grace will abound towards you, you know, and you will have all sufficiency in all things. And that's, that's just amazing that God will bless us like that. Right. Continue in verse 9, As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness being rich enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causes through us thanksgiving to God so again when God gives you these blessings and says that you know you you have abundance your bountifulness which like abundance um, it causes through us thanksgiving to God so when we give to other people when we give liberally to other people, that allows them to praise God for the blessing that, that through you God has given them. And that's how God gets praise, because it says, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. So not only should we be praising God and thanking God for what he's done for us, but through us, God can get the praise and, and thanks when we give liberally to others. 
uh, in verse 12 says, For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this administration, they glorify God for your professed subjection under the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. So again, God's goodness, if we're a liberal and cheerful giver, is to be sufficient in all our needs. But the purpose is to bring glory to God. That's the purpose of what we do. Anything is to bring glory to God, that his name would be praised. But his name is praised when we give. And it says, uh, was by the experiment of this administration, they glorify God for your professed subjection under the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution under them. So again, that's an important thing. But we give God praise, not just with our lips, but also with our works, through the works of our hands, through the things we do. And giving is a spiritual thing. You know, when you're giving in the place of Christ and causing his name to be praised, and that's something you will get rewarded for. He promises that not just on this earth, but also in heaven. And, uh, you know, we should be gi giving not just out of the abundance, but, you know, we even see examples of people giving above that. Um, I'll get you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he, hath, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. And that goes back to the Old Testament where he said, you know, you'll collect an omer. Everybody had an omer. He that gathered more had an omer. He that gathered less had an omer. Everybody had the same amount. And that's the picture that he's giving here. But it says Jesus Christ was, was rich. He's got all the cattle on a thousand hills. Jesus owns everything. He created this whole universe, everything in it. But he became poor for us so that we can be rich. Through his poverty, we might be rich. Now, again, that's not rich in riches, but also you know, rich spiritually. But he's saying it should be an equality. So if one, if one church is doing really well and one church is doing poorly, then the one who has abundance should be helping out the other so that there's a quality, so that the work can still get done, but in a different area. And that's why, you know, between the two churches, we have blessed hope and here. There's a lot of giving between the churches because, you know, we want to make sure there's a quality, that they're not missing out on being able to pay their pastor and being able to go soul winning and getting their materials. You know, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. When they first started up, they didn't have a lot of money, so we sent a lot of stuff down there to help get them started. And now they've got our pastor. Like, we've given up our pastor for a year. <laughs> like, but we gave liberally with a cheerful heart because we understand the brethren down there didn't have a pastor. They need equality. And we have good men here who are preaching on his behalf. But, you know, it's, it's great to have. But this also isn't teaching some kind of socialism or communism. You know, so the government stealing your money to give to others is wicked. Especially those who are lazy and won't work. You know, as again, Brother Jason preached this morning, if man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. God gives us clear commandments that we are to work six days shall thou labor, which you rest on the seventh. But, you know, so we're to be liberal to good, upright men who are working. And they might just be down on their luck to help them to, you know, provide for their families and things like that. Unexpected bills come up and they can't afford it, then we can help out. We can, out of our abundance, we can help our brethren to make sure there's equality among the brethren. But it's done willingly, not forcefully. That's the difference. Someone's not stealing your money to give to somebody else is undeserving. But the Lord says you should give to those who need. Uh, so 
I'll just read to you from Mark 12, 41. It says, And Jesus said over against the treasury, And behold, how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. For they, all they did cast in their abundance, but she of her, of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So that should be your heart. You don't have to give up everything, but you should be, if it came down to it, if, if you had to, you should be willing to give, not just out of your abundance, but also out of your living, you know, if that was called upon from God. But we'll close on this. If you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. But God is good, and his goodness is supreme. He's given us so much, and that's why we should show the goodness of the Lord to others. Ephesians 5 verse 8 says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the, in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable under the Lord. So it says here, the fruit of the Spirit is goodness and the goodness of god is manifested in us through that spirit that's why we have that same spirit christ was given without measure but we have the earnest of the inheritance the spirit dwells within us and we should also manifest the goodness of god through the spirit through our spiritual works through the things we do that have eternal value so if we walk in the spirit we can be a comfort to our brethren we can be a comfort to the world through the gospel of christ we can be a comf comfort to our brothers and sisters by preaching the scriptures to them, finding words of comfort. And the Lord himself will comfort you because you're children of God. And that's all done um, because we have faith. All those things are done through faith. I'll just read to you from Exodus 34, just verse 5. It says, And the Lord descended in the cloud... And stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. I mean, that basically covers everything I covered today, is it speaks of God here, how God is a God of goodness and long-suffering and mercy, but also that he will protect us from our enemies, that he will judge our enemies. So I just want to recap those points again. The goodness of the Lord is comfort in your time of need, both from the Lord and from the brethren. The, uh, the goodness of the Lord is protection from your enemies if you seek the comfort and protection of the Lord. It's grace and mercy from the Father as you walk with him every day. It's salvation of the soul through faith in Jesus Christ, freely through his gift. And that is the unspeakable gift. A new heavenly body at the resurrection where we will dwell with God forever as brethren of Christ. You know, with the same, the same resurrection that Christ had. It's the abundance and liberality from God, which we can share with others the glory of, to bring glory to his name. And it's the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness, and we show that goodness of the Lord through the preaching of his word, through the preaching of his gospel, and through the liberality of our giving. So let's pray. Lord God, Father, we just pray that uh, 